welcome to all of you already locked in to the live proceedings here on my Facebook page that is Lofty Dira. It is just about 24 minutes, 25 minutes past 6 o'clock in our region. And yes, I want to say a special welcome to all of you in Dominica at this time, those of you in the region. It's always a pleasure to have you on board. And yes, we know with social media, basically it's a global village. And so those of you further afield, thank you as well for tuning in. Your responsibility, as I always say, it is to share that live information so that others know that that discussion is happening at this time. Dominicans, those of you from this island, those of you living out, but you are from Dominica, May 29, wherever that special date comes around, it's always a time of reflection for some, it brings sorrows for some, some, you know, it, it, it brings back a lot of different memories as it were. And so every year, every date on that year around that time, I try my very best to have different perspectives on the matter, all in the interest, all in the aim of really and truly trying to document, factually that is, what really and truly transpired on that very day, May 29, 1979. And so with me this afternoon, I have three esteemed gentlemen here, Mr. Marjel Dura, no stranger to you out there. Marjel Dura was here with me twice already for that very same reasoning, and so he's no stranger. Also, Mr. Evans John. Evans John, you'll be hearing much more from him later on in the proceedings. No stranger to us in Dominic as well. A man who has worked tirelessly and still continue to work for his country, Dominica, in one way, shape, or form. And so, this evening's discussion, I can tell, will be very, very interesting in terms of their recollections of things that transpired back then. And as well, Brother Bernard Ito, again, this brother is a formidable brother, uh, no stranger to us in Dominica. He too has a perspective as it relates to what really and truly happened back then. And I guess he would want to tap into, quote unquote, where do we go from there? Any lessons learned? And so Brother Bernard Ito will be bringing that to the table as well in terms of the discussion. Uh, folks, it is not just a matter of talking about 79, but it is all about learning. It's about where we were as a country. Have we, have we progressed? Um, anything to learn? And so that is the gist of the discussion. And I said, just to reiterate, um, I'm planning to document factually the, the 70s, that era, because it is a very pivotal point in our history. And I think in truth and in fact, it can do well in terms of learning for the younger generation indeed. So without much more delay, let me just move across and, and say a pleasant good evening to you, esteemed gentlemen. Any one of you can go first in terms of just a, a further introduction of yourselves. Okay, good evening, Lofty, and good evening to your viewers. It's a pleasure to be back here. May 29, 1979. I don't think that date is very easy to But um, life as the board. So I try my best to recollect you know, many of the events that we pulled in on that day and prior to that as well. So they didn't start on the event, they started way before that. But um, it culminated on the 29th and the doctor got the strike and everything like that, followed the PJ government and everything like that. So my pleasure. And thank you for inviting me. All right, indeed. Brother Marshall, thank you very much for you talking to us, introducing yourself as it were. Well, next in line, the brother, Mr. Evans John. How are you, sir? I'm fine. Looking fine? Yes, I am. <laughs> Pleasure speaking to you, Evans. Uh, that, that, that is a date we had planned for some time now, but you're here this afternoon. And again, just some opening remarks, sir. Yes, thank you for inviting me. And a pleasant good evening to your viewers and listeners. My name is Evans John. I'm a retired police inspector. And at that time, I was the commander of the riot squad. Okay. And prior to that, I worked in the CID and had to follow up and cover most of the meetings that were held prior to that date. Mm -hmm. 
and um, subsequently on the 23rd I was sent out of Dominica to monitor the guns that were supposed to have come in into Dominica for the overflow. I was sent on a secret mission. Nobody knew I was other than the Prime Minister and the Chief of Police. Okay. Unfortunately, in my absence, I lost a daughter. The day after her birthday, the 25th of May. So I was recalled and she was buried the following day. And um, I remained home for two days. And when I reported, the police headquarters, the Tuesday, the riot squad was there waiting me. And I told the chief of police I could not manage it. So I was sent up to the ministry in plain clothes. And from there, I will see what happened. Yeah. So basically, what I got from you so far, you'll be giving us some eyewitness reporting recollections as a group. So you were there? Yes. In the Fika Pinga Pins. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you indeed. <clears throat> Looking forward. Brother Ito, good yeah. afternoon, bro. Good afternoon, Lofty, and good afternoon to all your listeners, viewers. As you said, <coughs> you're probably familiar with my name. I am the current leader of the Dominica Freedom Party. Um, I actually was there as well at a much younger age, of course, than this <laughs> esteemed gentleman. Yes, yes, yes. But I was, you know, I was a young, you know, preteen uh, boy at the time, but I actually lived in the vicinity mm -hmm. of the action. You know, in fact, I know Inspector John very well because he lived basically on my my lane. Okay. Um, so I, I, I probably saw him going down that afternoon to, to report it. Um, and I and, and a lot of my old, old, older brothers were involved in the action there. In fact, the gentleman who was shot actually lived on my lane as well and killed. So I'm very intimately familiar. I remember vividly the, 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 um, the events. I remember people running, bleeding, tear gas in, I, I wanted to go into the action, but wisely my father would not let it, but I wanted to. Um, and I was very strangely politically um, uh, conscious, okay. <laughs> that even at that early age. I used to read the newspaper, follow the events, and try to figure out what was going on. So, so I would say I have a, a personal connection to the event. Okay. Um, but again, as a, as a political scientist kind of person as well, I also have an interest um, from an academic point of view, of understanding how that event affected our political development mm -hmm. and our political history, and what were the outcomes of that? Did we advance? Did we go back? What were the implications of how Dominica's political development had been going to that point in time? So that's really the perspective that I'm looking forward to explore on the program tonight. Well, that too is, 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 a, is a critical part in terms of, you know, what have we learned, basically, from, from those events in the 70s. But, but gentlemen, as we make a start, I, I know based on my listening, because I wasn't there. I was just about three years old, so I really cannot talk to events all of that day. I, I heard, and, and that's why I'm trying my best to, to get it factually recorded. And it's people like you guys that we need to continue things that can bring some kind of, 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 of factual recollections, as it were. Uh, but, but based on what I read and know, 29th of May 1979 did not just evolve on that day. It didn't just happen. Um, can you put some kind of perspective as to going back some of the years before? What, what were the mood of the people back then? What were some of the events that, that led up to that very dreadful day? As you rightly say, um, prior to this, and the years leading to independence, I, there seemed to have been some disagreement about Patrick John taking us into independence. It started from there. Okay. Or whether the persons also, or the, 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 I would call them the society people, did not accept Patrick John as the person taking us into independence. Yes. So it started right there. But first of all, I am John. No connection with Patrick John. <laughs> so from there, there was turbulence in the 70s, 77, 70, Six, 
there were turbulence when Patrick thought of taking us in, in, into independence. As a matter of fact, in 1977, I was sent to Tortola together with Mr. Burnaby, who was then commander of the Defense Force. And I, as the head of the Special Service Unit, we were sent to Tortola and being trained by the British as instructors to deal with situations like this. Okay. Right? Civil disturbance and counter insurgencies. So we were trained as instructors. And then that is where the SSU was, was born, under my command. So you had the Defense Force and you had the SSU, a special military force within the police force. Okay. So we could have operated independently outside of the defense force. We were training paramilitary. So I was the commander, and from the 76, 77 into 78, that's where all the problems started. And for independence, I was the one who was selected to the Princess Margaret Personal Security Officer. So I have pictures at my home together with her. Okay. So I actually handed over the flag of independence. So I'm very familiar with what was happening prior to, okay. because there was an undercurrent okay. with Patrick John taking us into independence. So. In 79, less than a year, within eight months, eight months, the action, it happened. And with all due respect to Mr. Ito and his party then, um, it was, I must say, Ms. Charles was the main opposition person to Patrick John taking us into independence. Okay. I don't want to say the Freedom Party. But she was the person. So I think it started from there. And I can remember when I returned to Dominica after the news of the death of my, the riot squad was assembled at police headquarters awaiting me. The defense force was at their headquarters. Then a group of policemen was sent Plain, uniform and plain clothes policemen were sent to the ministry. The mob was already there. Okay. So I was part of the plain clothes police in the House of Assembly. And as the things start developing and the violence and aggression start, they send more uniform policemen, not the riot squad. Okay. Not the riot squad. Then I saw when Patrick John arrived. And um, OG Seraphin, they were attacked. But we were able to whisk them in. But the physical assault went on. Corriet was a minister then. And when he, we locked the gate to the upstairs, that is where the problem started. Stones and bottles coming from Pong. We could see people run into the river, putting piles of stones and pelting stones at the building. Okay. But by then, we did not call in the riot squad. We were waiting on instructions from the chief of police, who was based at police headquarters. Okay. The appearance of the defense force, I don't know at whose command they came. But I saw them coming up Kennedy Avenue. And people started pelting stones and bottles at them. And some members were able to go on the um, stadium court where there was the Rose Girls School. I remember. And they were taking shelter behind the wall while they were pelting stones at them. Mm -hmm. I know was in the House of Parliament looking out and making notes of who I could identify. And um, I heard a gunshot at one time. But there were several gunshots. So, so what you're saying, Brother John, in the crowd, the mass of people that were there, roughly about how many people were there? Oh roughly. my God. Those are, those about are three people. or 4,000 people. No, no, no. Right? Think, no, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. It's a discussion, so I, you know. I, I, I don't think, because I was 
eliminate the building ministry or building itself. Uh -huh. I had a section of men that they gave me Mr. John can remember the problem. In my opinion, there was anything between 15,000 and 15,000 people downstairs. Because you had Bath Road, that T there, Bath Road, you had Kenya Avenue, and then Hills Street. And all the streets were jump packed like a triple cable on, 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 on a roof in morning. That is my opinion of the world. Or if I even just jump in a little bit. But let me let me just quickly support him on these numbers because yes. I read a report that said after the event that it was the largest crowd yeah. assembled in Rosu uh, except for independence. Mm -hmm. So it was a massive crowd. It yeah. had to be about 15 to 20. Yeah, independence. I was there, I was the ensign escorting the flag. I think the crowd was about 20,000. Okay. And they went so back for the independence night. And, but that May 29th crowd, as in Kenyan Avenue, was packed. Bath Road and Hinsborough Street. Tell you, I, I, not too long ago, I looked on social media, I saw a triple cable and a jubilee. Like the beef run? Mm -hmm. That was like that. Uh, and then I just want to pick it back a little bit. That thing, I want to call it thing, didn't start in 79. That started way back around somewhere in 1971. Year. 1971. I wasn't a member of the Defense Force yet, but I was en route. I remember the 16th of December, 1971, when they invaded the House of Assembly opposite DPS Radio then now. When you say day, Marja, who, who did A crowd of people. A crowd of people. Okay. A crowd of freedom people. Fighters. Freedom fighters. Mostly opposition. They were called freedom fighters. They were called freedom fighters then. Mm -hmm. Now they come, the defense force commander, the commander of the Royal Platoon. I don't know if Mr. Mean. John remember. Yeah. He was a white man. Mr. Mr. Chambers, Chambers. John Chambers. And then, I was in Parliament. Well, he's dead now. I can call his name. But the trade union is Zaboka. Living. Walked in and then he picked up the mace from his stall. I was there. And from there, you know, Mr. Libla was in was the premier then, you know, and things started going and going and going. Because in the Rosal catchment area, you had the maybe the bush or the upper class. Mm -hmm. And in Pomali, we, you know, like me and you downstairs down there. Yeah. So when things started heating up on Mr. Ribla, he felt, ah, I can't take that. I'm going back to my village Yekas. So you had some people in there, like um, Mr. Amor Ronald, who is not dead. This is me, yes, it's another. But the leadership of the party went to Patrick, the little man from Lana. And as John said, that created a stir. Created a stir. Who is Patrick John? To lead Dominica and then so, you have... Marcel, yeah, let me just, let me just take a lick of pin there. Because I really want the people to understand what was the situation that they moved in. You said Lee Blanc was there as Prime Minister, right? As Premier. Yeah. As Premier. And he was facing yeah. what kind of, 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 of security? What, what? I mean, this, the same thing, you know, like a country book, he is our leader. Mm -hmm. And then we have a family to be in society, uh, lawyers and businessmen. So it's like a sort of an upper class yes, versus a lower yes, class issue. Yes, right. A yes, class issue. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, well, Patrick was a little man in Lago. Yeah. Short. Black. Okay, forget the color. So so what you say, that pressure in your estimation, in you guys' estimation, got to Lee Blanc that caused him to say, you know something, let me just give up the ghost on that. Yes, man, and let me and let me go back as and chill. Okay. So the leadership of the party now went to Patrick. You understand? And Patrick was extremely popular. You, anybody can tell you that he was extremely yeah, he popular. Was, uh, Down to earth. Yeah. You understand? He would meet you and talk with you and, and, and whatever, whatever. Carnival. Carnival, play football and everything like that. So, I think I mentioned that before. He and Eric Gary were close friends, very close friends. So when Gary went into independence in 1974, Patrick followed. And I can recall, I don't know if everyone can remember that, but I can remember the final night of debate before that delegation left Dominica for England.
to meet people like Colin Luan and these guys, you know, to put the final things for independence. Because the vote has to be passed in Parliament. Yeah. Mamo fainted. Remember that, John? Yeah. Mamo fainted in Parliament for the bill not to pass. I remember Patrick saying, eh eh, because I was there. Patrick saying, eh eh, faint or not, it will pass. Anyway, the bill was passed, and a couple of days later, he went to England and then they finalized it. But it was not a fait accompli, you understand, to see the little man become Prime Minister of Dominica. Okay. And as Evan said, and I've mentioned that here before, in the decade of the 70s, you, have an, you had a number of strikes, yeah. mm -hmm. civil service strikes, led by the General Secretary, then Mr. Charles Sapien. The incident with Papa Dida and Yeah. At DBS Radio. With Christopher Maxime. Yep. Mr. Sims. Yep. You understand? You know, all those events, as though, hey, who are you to be the Prime Minister of Dominica? And we have more well known people <coughs> we're talking. Let's see. Remember Edward Scooby, that powerful speaker yeah. for the Freedom Party and the platforms, Alvin and Trading, you know, and Stalin Strad, you know, and a whole, a whole set of them, you know. And then, just to see briefly on May 79, I was upstairs, so I wasn't dumb, you know, to see the whole just, thing. Just stick up in on, on, on the upstairs for it. Um, Ito wanted to say something based on what um, no, you want to discuss. Yes, Ito. I wanted to add a little perspective, I used to be historical perspective. Yeah. So, um, to some extent, that is true, it's still true. Uh, there was a classism in Dominica that's always been there, long, long time, going all the way back to the 1800s, right? You always had the, you know, the lighter complexion people who were the inheritors, really, of the estates and so on. You know, and had a, there, was a, there was no doubt there was classism in Dominica at mm -hmm. the time. Um, but the real issue, well, at least certainly a contribution issue to that, beyond the classism, was the, the acts that uh, Saturday Flibla was trying to pass because the, the Freedom Fighters, who would eventually became the Freedom Party, actually were protesting the passage of this act which limited the publication of criticism of the government. Yeah. And that was the first volley, if you wish, in this war. Uh, the fact that Libla wanted to pass, pass an act that said on you can't on his own, that you cannot criticize the government in print and this was the libel and seditious act. Mm -hmm. And so that was really the legal discussion, right? I don't think it was triggered by, oh, your little man, well, I'm sure, maybe that had some part to yeah. play in the, the dialogue, but the, the, the thing that triggered the action was you can't stop, as a democratic government, opposition voices from criticizing. It was like, it's like Dave Skerritt said, no one can criticize the government and shut down King 95. And so those attorneys, Mamo, certainly Eugene and Charles was a big proponent of individual rights, were protesting them. And so that led to constant friction in the 70s, as was rightly said, a series of actions and reactions. And, and this, this action in 1971, certainly an illegal act to invade the House of Parliament, but it was also in, the, in an attempt to prevent the passage of that bill, which in fact it did. And so that was delayed, but that also laid the foundation because the, the, the defense force was essentially not ridiculed, but made to feel small that they could not prevent the crowd from entering parliament in 1971. And so let's just say they had it. This will not happen on our watch again. So part of that laid the foundation for some of the actions that happened in 79. So, so just to piggyback on the point that you made already, Bill, is that initially Libla wanted to pass. Yes. Can any one of you guys, Margel or Evans, remember uh, some of the utterances, the writings? Or uh, were they libellous, were they defamatory nature? I did these writings in the paper that Libla subsequent Patrick then wanted to look, sort of you know, put, put an end Libla. 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 I cannot remember, but I was on duty inside the House of Assembly. I was on duty and was part of the riot squad, which was assembled where the the the, the primary school, the Saint Mary's Primary School, is presently. That's where. But I was in the House of Assembly when they invaded. When they invaded the, the House of Parliament. Okay. 
I was part of the investigation. When he smashed the maze, when he damaged the 13 chairs, which was 13 parliamentarians, yes. they jumped on the chairs. They were, the chairs were made of cane. They jumped on them and burst all the thing. I was part of that investigating team. Okay. And I gave evidence in the inquiry. Okay. I, I saw what happened to John Chambers, who was a then member of the Defense Force, on the southern entrance. Right? I saw when Zabuka entered the western entrance and pushed Mr. Pierre and coffee, um, Copper Coffee. He sustained a broken arm. Copper Coffee sustained a broken arm because they came from inside the library grounds okay. into the House of Assembly. And the whole, the southern entrance was surrounded and they invaded the place and took over the maze. And Eustace Francis was the Speaker of the House at the time. And he had to pull his private weapon and they, they smashed the maze. So in the 70s it started, as Marshall rightly said. It's subsequently they sent me to train in, in, by the British in, in 77. And this continued until 1979, the bomb exploded. Yeah, because after the, the, the main event on killing every near own government headquarters yeah. there, the thing carried on, you know. It carried on. Remember, they, 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 they burned down the registry upstairs, the current house was in the chambers now. Yeah. It was upstairs. on the 16th of June. They set that place on fire. You understand? Mm -hmm. And then, Phantom. Um, right in front of the cathedral, so Louis Kunzlatik was the interim president. They dragged his car out of it because he was living right garage. there. That was his garage. They dragged the car and they set the car right. Franz was owned by one of his children or daughters. His, and niece, so. his niece. His niece. They ransacked the place. And set the car on fire. Set the car on fire. That wasn't enough. They went by Eugene Thomas, where Jay's book so is now located. Yes. Please shade him and decade his thing. That wasn't enough. They went by Kazimi, where Papi used to have his office there, you know, in that little block by the market there. Yes. Drums of oil. Yes. Just roll that on the floor and open that and then just throw the oil. Wow. Went by Flossy. Same thing. Bust bags of flour and rice and just pour oil on that. Ramsack the place. And then Parish Hall, you remember, was the meeting place. And then they, 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 they call, the orders were given tonight, we go into pay Jojo Karam a visit. And then ask Peter Karam what happened to them that same night. Cool wash, cool wash on Cox Street. And then that wasn't enough. They threatened to poison the water at River Deuce because we didn't have, we didn't have um, a water system. So the water was just there, a dam. a dam, and they threatened to poison the water. And then Defense Force 99 men, you understand, you stretched to the max. And then we had to end up guarding prison, guarding ministers of government, um, state properties, you know, buildings and so on. Plus the water catchment in, in River Deuce, that's behind ends all of that. It wasn't an easy thing. You understand? It was not an easy thing. You understand? Like this morning, I heard people talking about gunshot. I heard the gunshots, but as I, as a British trained soldier myself, remember Evans with Snowy yeah. going all over the Caribbean mm -hmm. with Colonel Fraser all. I wonder which, Caliber. which commander would be on the ground and his troops come under fire that he will not return the fire. And weapons could be knife, it could be web bullets, it could be stones, it could be anything. Because at my vantage point in the house of the general chambers up there, I could see stones coming from pump. I wouldn't see any people throwing them, but you could see the stones if all is coming down. Yeah. Run on the other side facing sectional ministry facing goodwill. 
bags of gum said bags and crocos, bags of stones. And I still remember two of my colleagues who attended the Dominican Grammar School, Lenny Stitznow, who were former footballers, pelting boulders from the river up to the top floor of the ministry and breaking the glass. Before that, before that, I heard about this meeting at the parish hall mm -hmm. that sort of, you know, brought the people well, the, 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 to the, that place. To me, to me, because just like Evans was operating on the cover, I was doing the same thing too. I was tasked with the responsibility by the commander, Major Newton, then, me, so rest in peace, and the recorder. And I had to go to all meetings and listen and then come back, you know. Okay. To, uh, but the hottest meeting was in at the junction of Federation Drive. Foot, foot of Federation Drive there, using terror on Simon Porch upstairs. Mm -hmm. That's where they were told what to do the following day. Expect your gas, go with your towel, wet it, you know, and this and that and this and that. So the people were they were primed to get into that. On the question of the shooting of Philip Timothy, I did skip at times in England. Weapons. And from my experience, I still remember some of the things. When I sent two soldiers to recover the body of this first return of when they were killed, I turned him over, I turned him. Yes, he was shot with a body of a bullet, he got a bullet. Okay. But it wasn't it wasn't an SLR. It wasn't a nine. Because I remember in the seventies when you were doing what they call it counter terrorist fighting in the hills, he always carried an SMG. Yeah. That was his favorite like weapon. weapon. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it, and that's a nine caliber weapon. British. British. You understand? That is his favorite. So it wasn't a nine, it wasn't a fear free, it wasn't a seven point six. It was what they call small arms. Maybe a two two a two two or three two or not even a forty five. No. Yeah. Not in my 45. Sure. Because the hole didn't go through. And Evans can tell you, as somebody who dealt with weapons, penetration force. These are um, high caliber weapons. Anytime you get hit with a 7.62 or a 303, hold at the back. The hole at the back is like a bucket. Wow. And then if you, like I heard some callers, if you look at the angle mm -hmm. of the Let's see where the riot platoon was mm -hmm. and where the bullets hit the treasury. Mm -hmm. The height of them could not take Timothy. That could not hit Timothy. And the Dominican Defense Force, the soldiers on duty then, did not want to kill him. So where exactly does it, where exactly was Timothy shot? Just no. on his Street. Well, you, you see by that? By the palm tree. Yeah, on his Street, yeah. by the palm tree there. By the back of the treasury. Yeah, opposite the treasury. Opposite the treasury in that place. Yeah, yeah. Around, 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 around that place where they have, you know, we call it Andrew's furniture there. Yeah, right. Somewhere around there. Okay, right there. Right there. Right there. Because I stayed upstairs. I saw when he dropped. I saw when he, when he dropped. When he buckled, when he, he buckled and he fell. Then I got this. Somebody told me, hey, yeah, somebody dropped where they and picked up. So I sent two private soldiers to recover the body on the stretcher. When they came, I turned the body. He was still breathing. I turned the body. The whole of said, but it didn't go through. I said, that cannot be a field trip. Cannot. And then, if you look at that, if you look at the height where the bullet holes were, now they blocked it. You could see that way above people's head. And anytime, as my former colleague or still friends will tell you, if any police man, woman, defense force soldier had fired a free or free or a SLR through that crowd, Several people would be there. It would be a domino effect. People would just fall in down. Can go up to a mile. Of course. Of course. Wow. Yeah, man. I need to give a time. So you guys seeing here tonight, definitely, you'll be trained in that, in that field. Yeah, I, I did. I did. The, the defense force did not open fire on the ground. No, man. No, as but it, as as it, you. it did not come from <clears throat> it didn't police, come from, from It did not come from... Oh, one of the weapons. It, no. it did not come from either the police or defense force weapon. No. Because it, you were carrying SLRs and 303s. You understand? Yeah, type of weapons. The type of weapons, okay, these are high velocity weapons and they do 
tremendous amount of damage, especially on the exit end. Yeah. Especially on the exit end. A 45 will match up your bone. Okay, Angelo Allen is watching here. He's, he's asking, he's saying something here. Um, Lofty, it's a fact that the public unrest started years before 1979. Can you ask Mr. John to mention about the conflicts between 71 through 75? That's when the SSS was formed, Special Security Squad. Can he remember that we left Dominica on a British battleship to be trained with the Royal Marines in Anguilla and Luxmore? Angelo Allen. And Montserrat and St. Kitts. Yeah. <laughs> I did some training. I did some training in Montserrat. I did some training with Royal Marines in Montserrat. Sure. I remember Pestina being there. Right? So I did some military training with the Marines in Montserrat. But, but Lofty, let me, let me add sure, some facts. Well, I call them facts because I'm, I've, studied, I've studied this in detail, right? I've studied the, the Commission of Inquiry report, and I've studied it in history and then I've done a lot of research on it. Um, I, a lot of what the gentlemen have said is factual and, and correct. I mean, they were eyewitnesses to a lot of that. Mm -hmm. But there, there are some nuances to it that we need to consider, right? First off, we have to understand that there were two squads of the defense force, right? The riot squad, which advanced by Queen Mary Street up Kennedy Avenue, which advanced up towards the crowd, mm -hmm. which did um, encounter protest action at that time. Um, then there was the, the, the convoy protectors who accompanied the prime minister and the other ministers and they were there to protect the prime minister. And, and Captain Reed himself trailed that convoy into the, in that morning. Now, the report concludes that indeed the riot squad of the defense force fired warning shots over the heads of the protesters. They, um, they did not fire into the crowd, they were very clear in that. The, 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 that squad was not held responsible for the deaths or the shooting of any people at that period. However, they did issue, um, issue tickets. Yes. And if we have to put the chronology of things in perspective, that is when the real rioting and stoning and attacks upon the defense force occurred. It did not occur as a natural response of the crowd was there protesting. It, uh, it was a response to two events. The tear gas that was uh, shot into the crowd and the beating of Brother Germain which occurred on Kennedy Avenue. Those two events triggered the crowd to a reaction, a okay. protest reaction, and standing of stones and then start to attack the, the squad. Now, that happened. Now, the firing of the shots. Now let's establish some facts here. There were several people shot that day. It's not simply Philip, Philip Timothy. So we cannot, I don't think, say that all of these people were shot by private individuals with small arms in the crowd. That I think I think that would be an extreme assertion. So roughly right. how many people were shot? Roughly. There were at least six people shot. Uh -huh. There Philip Timothy was shot and killed. The gentleman next to him was shot in the leg. Algonan, um, I don't remember his last name, was shot in the thigh, came bleeding to my father's home. Um, a young boy was shot through the air, emerged through his mouth. A young girl suffered several shrapnel shots through the chest. And there were a few other people. A, a man was shot and his arm was, arm was almost severed. And now he's permanently disabled in that arm. So let us establish the facts. There were at least six or seven people severely injured by fire, the rifle fire, and the gentleman was shot, could not have been in his arm, couldn't be small arms because his arm was almost torn up. So there was definite fire capable of injuring half a dozen people on that day. Okay. And one of those people was killed. These are the facts. I think it is, it is too much to, to establish that all of these people were randomly shot by private citizens intended on creating mayhem. Let's establish that fact. So in that context, I think it's a stretch to say that Philip Timothy was not a victim of that same fire. Okay, that right. somehow Philip Timothy was an exception to the fire that damaged and shot 
several half a dozen dominoes. But the point I got um, into that Margel and Evan say the, the type of ammunition that they carry, type of weapons, well, it, yes. it, it basically would do much more damage to the six people if it was the defense force. That's what I'm getting. But you I heard Evans made the point when he said he heard a lot of shots right. as to where the shots came from, who are these, 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 these um, weapons. It's not yet established, but at least. But, but they are only talking about the wounds that they saw in mm -hmm. Timothy. Yeah. The wounds to the other people were grievous wounds that came from high powered weapons. As I indicated, you can read the report 1979, still in the archives. One hand, man, hand was almost blown off. Another person was shot through the head and it came through their mouth, removed a large portion of his cheek. Uh, another person was shot through the thigh, removed a large chunk of. of, of, of that's a photographer guy. Alvanan. Yeah. No, Alvanan no, was a, a, he worked in forestry forest for a guide individual. Okay. And friend of the family. Mm -hmm. So yes. I saw him, yeah. he was brought to my father's home with a large hole in his leg. And so to establish that all of these people were shot by low powered weapons in a random manner by people in the crowd, I think is stretching the joke, to be honest. Okay. Um, why is I'm not denying the fact that shots were fired and people got hurt, you know, one man got killed. But well, you made a point about somebody got hit with, with um, sharpness and so. That, means, one, yes. that means that came from a shotgun? Yeah, I'll think a shotgun. That, that came from a shotgun? Somebody Maybe a 14 or 12, yeah. major 20 a gauge. Shotgun. Well, so, so well, a shotgun. So there's a from uh, the, the cartridges of uh, ah, 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 ah. No. I believe a 12, uh, uh, 12 uh, uh, gauge or shotgun. 12 gauge? Or, or 14. 14, 20 gauge, something like that. There's somebody, right. I'm not saying the defense was, I don't know what weapons he had. He had three of them, come on. He had three right? of them. But, but other people getting shot yes. is not from a free of free rifle. Okay. It could be from a shotgun. So you're saying that the caliber, the seven or eight people who were shot, could be shot from a shotgun. all shot from private weapons. I'm, not, you know, I'm right. not saying it's private weapons. I'm okay. saying, as I say, I do not know whether the defense force had shotguns. Okay. In a riot squad, you're having shotguns. Okay, okay. In a riot squad, you're having shotguns. Okay. Right? But let's not focus on the shotgun. That's one minor thing. There were seven people shot with grievous body wounds. The limbs were torn off. Massive tissue were blown off people. These were not shots from a private weapon. And if, if, even if Philippine if he was shot, not by a 303, Reed testified himself that he, he used his, 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 his sidearm, right, his private pistol, to shoot, and it's recorded, he shot at least 28 shots from his private pistol in the direction of the crowd. And he claimed it was in order to recover Philip Timmons, Timmons' body. But you have to record, as the gentleman well knows, how much uh, ammunition is issued, yeah, and you have to come back yeah, and see how much I ammunition is spent. Yeah. And there were 55 rounds of ammunition they could not account for. Now, those rounds, over 98 rounds were fired, they accounted for 40 something rounds, couldn't account for 55 rounds. And all those shots were fired by the squad who was accompanying the Prime Minister and by Reed himself, who was on ground issuing orders to recover the body and to cover the Prime Minister and so forth. It's clearly documented that shots were fired by the squad. Shots were fired into the crowd, and undoubtedly, seven people were shot by high powered weapons. I think the conclusion should be clear. Uh, I don't know. I still have my doubts about. I, I, well, I, I never read the report. I didn't test it. What I'm going to test it, I was going to say, I remember the inquiry was made by Colonel Martin Dale from the Guyana Defense Force. When I said, it's been made from the Sergeant. Stay out of that. Stay out of that. On my leg, I, I saw other but you know, I saw. I saw, I came, I saw, I came, I saw it. So, yes, I heard the shots. I'm not denying shots were fired. I'm not denying that at all because I, I heard from upstairs. I heard. Obviously, if the Prime Minister or whoever is coming through a crowd, 
You are going to the, you have to cover the prison. Okay. You have to protect that individual is the prime minister or the president or so well, 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 so well. Nobody mentioned about destroying the gate, as we said, when they match up the gate downstairs. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Rip off the gate. Nobody mentioned about the, the, the smashing of the police when you have that yeah. over 3930. Yeah. Nobody mentioned that. Nobody mentioned the guy who destroyed and damaged the state car and was given the packet by the president of France, the 504, the black one. Nobody mentioned that. Nobody mentioned that. You understand? So I agree with all of this by Yeah, because the thing, thing is the thing is people look at May 29th as a little thing, but it wasn't a little thing. It was not a little thing. Because if you have a, a, a demonstration, a riot, whatever you call it, and then from there you go to your meeting place and then you start planning. We're going to attack Lofty today. We're going to attack Ito. We're going to attack John. We're going to attack the bottle. So it's a systematic thing. Yeah. Now if you can stand on the platform and say tonight we're going to pay Lofty a visit on Cox Street and stone his house down, and yeah. then you're still threatening the population by poisoning the water. So where are you going to get water to drink? The people, when you poison the water, more innocent people are going to fall victim to that. Thing. So it wasn't an easy thing. It wasn't a thing on the surface. It was a deep, well-planned, well-orchestrated and executed thing. And it was serious. It was serious. But... In clear, in clear Saunders is saying here, it is established that guns were fired by both private individuals. Of course and the defense force, whose job it is to defend the prime minister and members of parliament and stop the civil war. So no, it wasn't, it was not Tea Party business. No, 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 it certainly wasn't a Tea Party no. business, but the, you have to ask the question, is it the right of a civilian force and a paramilitary unit to fire simply to um, establish control over a crowd to fire live ammunition as the first option into a crowd. The Commission of Inquiry clearly established you that this was an illegal move and was not justified under the Constitution and procedures, even under the police procedures mm -hmm. or even under the, uh, the Defense Force procedures. Clearly, that was wrong and an illegal act to proceed in that manner. So there is no doubt that it was an illegal act. It was not, and it, in fact, they concluded that Captain Reed should be removed from any further command of any sort of military or paramilitary unit for his negligence, negligence and his encouragement of those tactics in uh, moving the Prime Minister safely into the, the Prime Minister could have been escorted into the building by other means, shields and other things like that, safely without having to fire live ammunition as a first option at protesters who are there for, by the constitutional right. Protest is not illegal here. That is a constitutional right. And so the protesters were there. They were tear gas. People were beaten. Of course, they reacted, maybe overreacted, right? Throwing stones at the top and the, 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 the gates and all of that. Certainly, that did happen, throwing stones at the building. But the chronology is that that agitation started after the defense force um, tear gas the crowd and eventually open fire the crowd and the, the retaliation was the cold was really. Okay, I must establish there is a procedure yes. that needs to be followed when you're about to use tear gas, when you have to use weapons, yes. ammunition, you have to warn the crowd for a loud hailer. And were there any warnings on that day? From where I was in the House of Assembly, I could not hear. But I, I read in some document that said the, before they take us the crowd, they said this person or we smoke or okay. something like that. I, yes, I, I there, that. there is a procedure for you have to warn the crowd what you intend to do. Like if you're going to use tear gas, yes. you have to inform them this person or we shall use gas. Yes. This person, on three occasions, we might, we might use um, arms or we'll fire. Yes. You have to warn the crowd. You cannot go at random and just pulling gun and shooting people. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There have to be a warning procedure. There's a procedure. There is a procedure to follow. Procedure. 
Then you call that um, you call that internal security, IS. Yeah. And but then you, you get your instructions before you leave base. But the yeah, final decisions is are made on the ground on the by ground. the commander. Okay. They may give you yeah. the instructions from, from the answerable to, to everything. You understand and say, okay, that is the way. But when you get there, a time situation different. It's a different situation. You, the commander, now yeah. must use your, your discretion. Head, use your discretion and know what to do. And, and that, after that, that, you must write a report. You must write a report. That's what action you take. Yep. And, yep. And, and that is where Reed was criticized because Reed, who was the commanding officer, was on the ground issuing commands. Well, actually, if I may think, say to one with minute. no warning to the crowd, and that's what he was, he was cited for as. Mm. To okay, be, to be fine, but in any case, Malcolm was not the commander. I don't know, but he wasn't commander of the Royal Platoon. Well, no, not of the Royal Platoon. But he was. was maybe he, I mean, I, I could stay upstairs and see him, you understand, running around that thing. But he no, wasn't. He wasn't, the he wasn't commander of the Royal Platoon. No. I think that was Tyler or something. Like that. So, Dyer. 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 Dyer was the commander. Dyer was the commander of the. Right. right. But we came in and overrode yeah. the protocol well, and captain. he issued direct orders to cover the Prime Minister by fire. Wow. And he was the one who issued that order and he was also the one who issued the order to recover Philip Timothy's body, body under the cover of additional fire. And that's where a lot of the damage and to people occurred and, and shootings occurred. But again, so I Reed was directly responsible and that particular squad, now I don't know who or what, but I'd certainly say Reed is the pivotal character there. And he may well have been the one shot in firing 20 something shots from his personal pistol into in the direction of, of, of the inspiration. But again, um, according to military practice and procedure, mm -hmm. if you're in a hostile situation and you have to go and recover a body. You have to recall this clear. <laughs> you have to find a way it's to not get there. <laughs> you understand? You have to find a way to get there. And if it means covering the two or three people who's going to recover the body with fire, you have to. There, 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 there is a different procedure in, 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 in giving cover, right. Eh? Right. Well, not shooting at the person. Right. Right? But creating, a yeah, creating an atmosphere, an atmosphere to make it safe. Yes. Yep. yes. You have to. And not necessarily you have to shoot at, 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 no, at you don't at, have to shoot at people but if, if the right. need arises for instance if you come in somebody and you see two pointing a weapon at you and you see the muscle pointing at you you sit down there sure you have to no. defend that have to defend. but that was not the, the situation I there were no weapons pointing ground. at the um, defense force there were no the weapons there and they were just attacking but I was upstairs but I could you know see get a big run you know see what's happening downstairs and hear the voices and everything like that but 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 we will all agree as well based on the based on the effects of the bullets on the treasury building at height at that height much more lives would have been lost on that day oh, yes. yes yes we all agree with it. oh yes certainly and they shot above the crowd in several occasions yeah okay. yeah but they still shot into the crowd <laughs> that that we should establish as well right i'm not saying in fact the, the report establishes that the riot squad Never fired into to the squad, the, the um, crowd. They the only fired above their heads yeah. and in the direction of the Windsor Park Stadium, yeah. and they were clear. Yeah. That squad was over the head of the crowd. Yeah. Yeah. That's what so, they so do. So that was clearly established. Mm -hmm. So, so they were they were clear. Then they fired maybe thirty something rounds, and that but it was all over the heads. Yeah. But so, the, so the, in terms the issue was the yeah. squad yeah. protecting the prime minister and really himself personally issuing orders to fire in that for cover purposes and other. What so in terms of timing now of, 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 of that day, I, I, I read the rain came and sort of, you know, put a calm to the city, but, but for how long did that? Okay. About an hour, man. Let me, let me, when the rain came down. Let me go back. I, parliamentary was at the It was assigned to the House of Parliament, you know, security and everything like that. So I got there by 915, maybe. Okay. And I think the riots got came about. 11, so yeah, about 11. About 11. And um, about 11. About 11. Yeah. And then, what is it? About an hour, hour and a half, something like that? About an hour. Yeah, it wasn't very long. They didn't stay long. It's not very long because it started raining. 
and the, the crowd dispersed. The crowd dispersed, you know, and um, it was a bit hidden then. It was a bit hidden then. Oh, but it was after that. They were burning down Ruzo and then burning down Ruzo and back. Definitely sparked. Yeah. A, a sure, a decline to revolution. For sure. They did it. Well, once he was came out and was shot, shot yeah. and the country got enraged, well, let's say the opposition force yeah. got enraged, yes, they did a lot of violent, illegal action, yeah. honestly, um, to try to remove the government. All the stoning and the burning of the people were to force the ministers then to, to resign. resign. Because the strategy was, if we get all those guys to resign, we have to form a new government, yeah. right? That was the strategy. So uh, there was a lot of violence, there was a lot of, 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 of gorilla action, if you will. Yeah. Um, fire bombing, um, 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 Molotov top cocktails we use and talk to other people. And, and these things were done and, and businesses were damaged, but it was an, an effort there. It was revolution time at that time. It was, it's a revolution and we're going to get those guys out of office. And so attack them until they resign. That you happened as a fact. You can deny it. By Vic Rivier in Vic Rivier was told that his house and was in Mahoy. No? Vic Rivier. I saw when the, the, the what do you call that? Like Jingo Link or Courier thing tried to go down because Mr. Comes in the books, and the books say. Mm. You have to run to his rescue. Mm. I, like that. It was, I told you it wasn't an easy thing at all. It wasn't an easy my, thing. My, I have to confess that there was lack of communication between the defense force and the police on that day. Okay. And from who they got, the defense force got the instructions because the policemen that were at the ministry in uniform had to run away because they were not prepared for tear gas. They had no mask, nothing. Okay. So as to where the command came from, and I don't believe it's from our chief of police because we would have been aware that or they would have sent a mask for, for those at the thing. Something did not, there was lack of communication between the defense force and the police on that particular morning at the ministry. That is true, and the, the report does note that. Yeah. In fact, it says the police were not really responsible. They were caught unaware. They were caught unaware, and it was never made clear, but the finger was always pointed at Reed as the guy on the ground who started issuing orders to disperse the crowd and to shoot. I don't think that was, because there was meetings, I'm sure, prior. Yeah, the, the, the joint meetings. Joint meetings yeah. held prior, days prior. Yeah. And none of that was discussed, according to what the report said. There were joint meetings of, of, of the, for the operations. Yeah. Well, for me, I myself, I had my instructions what to do and what not to do, because as I said, I was upstairs. Okay. Yeah, I was upstairs. So as I said, downstairs was a, a, a different thing. But I could see the reaction of the people and the hostility. And I'm seeing Brother Peter Karam on the live feed here. He's, he's following the proceedings. <laughs> um, it is well established that their home got a, a battering as well. Yeah. Yeah. Can you guys speak to that in terms of the gravity of it? Well, um, I had a, how do you call it, a sneak peek of the meeting at the parish hall uh -huh. when the instructions were given and the words were, tonight we're going to pay to your car on a visit. A, a lesson. Or a lesson, something like that. And by the time evening came, the rest is history. We have to establish that he was a special constable. Eh? Yes, he was. And Zulu he Karam was a special constable and, and very Labour active with the Labour with, Party as well. With the Labour Party yeah, very, very and very also true. close to the police. Yep. Okay. So his family became a victim. Okay. Yeah, he was very close and he was very outspoken. Yeah, man. He right. Mr. So he has a natural target. So yeah. Following the law. Did he protect himself with his weapon? Yeah, he did. And that that he did, he stopped. Day after, the yeah. day after, when I went, so I to, close to him, so when, yeah. when the defense force was going to patrol in Tom, and then we looked at New Day Thomas's business place, we looked at Casimir, and we looked at Flossie. I said, no man, did you look at the human man? So well, you, I can say. Rice and flour, cake on the floor in oil, you know. With regards to Flossie, no. the Sunday morning I was going to service, and I saw some guys rolling about seven barrels of rum. Wow. I had to stop and recover. I was alone going to church. When they saw me, they ran. Mm -hmm. And I was able to recover the seven barrels of rum for Flossie. Just in Hillsborough Street, they were rolling them from Old Street, Ship Street, Old Street. 
And then I was able to recover the rum. The rum sacked plus his place. Correct. We keep this one. Now, def- all these things definitely happen. There's no doubt that a lot of damage, yes, vandalism, brutalism occurred after that event. Yeah. Only but again, it was a targeted strategy yeah. to, to go after the, the big supporters, yeah. which all of those guys were, yeah. and the ministers to force them to resign. Now, I'm not making a judgment whether it was. I mean, clearly it was illegal, yeah. and clearly it was damaged to people who probably didn't deserve it. Um, that's true. But again, we have to put it in context of a revolutionary war, right? At least people were not chopped to death like in Rwanda or shot yeah. by these people. They attacked property, they intimidated um, the, the ministers, and they forced them to, to resign. resign, right? And no one was killed or hurt. Could have been a lot worse in a revolutionary situation. This so I'm not justifying yes. necessarily the activity that was taken, but let's put in the context of this was a revolt to replace a government. And, and, and in all fairness, that was small, small, small change in terms of what could have happened, the, 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 the violence that could have happened. I remember they targeted um, ETP2, you know, the general manager, the Bobo Roy. Yeah. They targeted Roy Williams. Roy Williams. You know, and at ETP, selling sugar and, and rice, you know. Even when he tried to send some supplies to the hospital to feed the sick. Problems? They didn't want them to offload the food to feed the people at the hospital. Understand? Talking about yeah, talking about the resignations now. I, I heard today on a program with um, Wadix, mm-hmm. Mr. Seraphim. Seraphim, former Prime Minister. He said basically he did not resign because of the pressure that were exerted on that day or you know, events at late. He resigned because of some you know, he did not like certain things. The attorney general then Leo was Steve. involved with Leo Steve. But OJ resigned before this activity occurred, you see? OJ resigned before yes, he, OJ resigned he said that. He said that. Yeah, he said that. So yes, OJ had followed with the Labour Party government. So he really, his resignation is really not part of this thing we're talking about. He had already resigned and had issues. And someone else had resigned. Like, 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 but um, OJ definitely resigned out of policy differences. Okay. Because the same issues, again, the seditious acts and some of the things uh, PJ was trying to pass and some Disagreements, he had left the government, he resigned from the government. But it was not in response to um, his activities. That was, that was before. PJ said, let's, let's, let's turn our attention to Patrick John, the Prime Minister. Uh, how would you guys rate him now as to his actions then? He made, he made good for Dominica. What I find, he was a bit arrogant. But he meant good and was a very popular person with the ordinary person on the ground. He meant good for Dominica, but... And I must say, being around him and being there at the time, Lee Austin had a lot to do with whatever happened. Very influential. Leo Austin misguided the government, misled the government, misdirected them. I was more through the blame solely on Leo Austin as Attorney General at the time for what happened to Dominica on the government side. Yeah, that, 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 that point was sort of established in principle by OJ today. Yeah, but, but apart from that, Patrick was a really nice guy, you understand, very approachable, down to the you understand. But maybe there was, again, as I said, it was at the beginning, that, 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 that class thing, mm-hmm. you know, that class thing, you know. Maybe that was a part of it as well, you know, because there were very affluent people in society, as I said, you know, and things was, were changing, you know, things were trying to get there. Yeah. But, um, Something happened, and again, as John just said, maybe the advice from one, the legal advice from the, the Attorney General, who is the chief legal advisor, as we know. And maybe outsiders as well. You understand? Maybe outsiders as well coming in and say this and say that and say this and oh, do that. The you, you, do, you know, the word that and everything like that. So all of that could be part and parcel of it. Maybe the information comes in one ear and goes, and then 
you forget the good ones and then you take the bad ones, which eventually lets you know let you down. But on a one-on-one -on -one basis, I spoke to Patrick several times, mm -hmm. several, several, several times. I had the authority just to go to his office and knock with him, tell the secretary, this is what you I would have an audience with him. Understand? And most times he would listen to, to, to poor people as well. You know, listen to them as well. Case in point, when he built that housing scheme at Battle State, yeah. mm -hmm. in 1976, 77, there, when Patrick built that thing, I remember at a political meeting in, in Newtown. All due respect to this age of freedom, but in order to tables, not fit for human habitation. Wow. Yeah, I remember that, right on the Newtown Savannah. And then it went on like that. And then when Freedom Party actually won the elections in 1980 and formed the government, they wanted tirade to take the houses from, from the residents. You know, although, and then who saved us in Rutgers State? Then the DLM Alliance was formed with Para Rick there and Ron Green and company. Para took up that case. Para took it up. And that is what saved many people in Rutgers State. Because they call it stables because they are duplex houses, you understand? And Rutgers State is a thriving community now, a lot of beautiful houses. Yes, they are um, duplex houses. But some of some people have it. <coughs> yeah, yeah, and then they have to go upstairs as well, you yeah. know, change from wood to blocks, yeah, you know, yeah. and then, you know, it's, it's a good community, it's a you good know. Community. But let me make one point on that. Okay. When this Bath Estate community was originally established under so. PG, the people did not own the homes. They were public homes, and they did, just like Sierra is doing now, they didn't have title to it in any such thing. And it was really under the Freedom Party that Mamo insisted that you will pay a small amount of money and they will up in arms against that everyone criticized the government for that freedom party and that's part of the thing saying they ruled against it but the principle was pay a small amount of money there's a small amount compared to what you pay for marriage yeah. but you will earn the title to your home many people were rich by that but today many people have in retrospect, look back at that. That's the greatest thing that ever happened in their family's mm -hmm. lineage because now they have valuable property in a suburb of Ocean, which they own. And many of the older people look back and say, I hated Mama for that, but that was the best thing that she had done. Several people have testified to that. I've spoken to them. Yeah. And so there is, is a nuance. Yes, PJ did establish it, but he established it. And it was a good thing, very good thing. But the Freedom Party extended that into giving you private ownership and, and equity which is something that the Freedom Party is always big about. Sure. Let's just establish the point that you guys uh, made a while ago. This morning I had the opportunity to listen to, what's his name, uh, OJ, with what it's on DBS. Let's just listen a little bit in terms of his thoughts on Leo Austin being the sort of the main agitator of, of, of why things turned sour back then. Take a listen. Oh, and of course, just to ensure that you understand this, in my letter of resignation to Patrick at the time when I was unable to accept the fact that Lee Austin had caused so many difficulties for us along the way. There were expansive, yes, I could continue going on and on with a number of other issues that were unresolved because of that same Lee Austin. That I felt that at that time I was unable to accept that this person should remain in our cabinet. Now all that was all that was before the protest. That is way before protest. My my departure from Patrick's government had absolutely nothing to do with the protest, to be honest with you. It was mainly because of the latitude yes. of the that what was given. That is all it was. In fact, I believe my resignation was on the on June 1st of 1979. That is two days after the 29th of May. So it was not based upon any pressure from the outside. It, yeah, so basically establishing the point that yeah. we just made a while ago. Austin. Yeah, Austin. He was a guy, is he? Yeah, he was a guy. Nah. Short, short, that's yeah, the guy. He was a Speaking in a kind of way in tongues. Like, Why do you think he had, he had so much influence on PG? Well, let me comment on that because you had asked the question about um, an assessment of PG as a leader, as, yeah, a, yeah, as a personality, yeah, yeah. right? Um, and I do agree with this gentleman that he was a very personable, very likable man. 
and, and very down to earth and certainly connected with the, as you say, the common man in that way. That's all true. I have no arguments with that. In fact, he and my father, you know, used to be friends at some point. Um, but the problem with PJ was um, he was a misguided man. In my opinion, he was a misguided man, and he was easily influenced by the light of um, Leo Austin, who could bring in the most ridiculous schemes uh, that would uh, essentially take away the rights and freedoms of Dominicans mm -hmm. and establish a sort of totalitarian state and establish all sort of economic schemes that somehow he could benefit from on the back end. Similar things to what we see today, except a little more less sophisticated at the time. Mm -hmm. So Patrick John, while not necessarily, um, uh, you know, the, the, the most devious character, he was certainly a misled character. He was certainly an, a, 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 an a arrogant man to some extent who was looking to establish his firm power and would not accept that other voices in the community had a say, like the, the merchants, like the, uh, the, the freedom fighters, who were saying, you can't simply shut us up for criticizing if you think your policies are wrong. You can't simply pass laws that says we cannot speak. And so it was this arrogance and this attempt to subdue certain portions of the population who may not be your supporters, but it's a democracy. But would you, so would you say you though, couldn't do that? Yeah, would you say though, mm -hmm. just to juxtapose what you're saying, mm -hmm. we established earlier there was this sort of class issue. Yes. And here it is, this upper class quote unquote people did not want Patrick John to be prime minister. So obviously they applied the pressure on him. Patrick John having the power. He, uh, he, he, he reacted, he, he, he applied the pressure back onto them. Would you, he did it would you say that? Well, to some extent, true. But Patrick John was being criticized on his policies mm -hmm. and his proposals and his legislation, right? Patrick John had accepted a proposal to sell almost half of Dominica to South Africa as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a, 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 a free zone, as a, a you know, duty free zone to South Africa in the middle of and the appetite re regime. So from maybe a lie all the way to Postman would have belonged to South Africa had that scheme gone through. Now you as a Dominican, as, as a black man, sitting there, living in that situation, would you not protest those sort of policies and this sort of hair brain scheme which is also being um, proposed by Leo Austin and supported by Patrick? He had another deal with, um, uh, yes, all over the place, the gun runnings and trying to import weapons into Dominica, make profits of this. So there were many issues that Patrick John was involved in that were simply illegal acts that had they gone through and had these proposals gone through would have done a devastation to Dominica's economy and extreme devastation to our civil liberties. And so yes, it was, well, no, it was, it was reasonable right. that people were protesting that Dominica's civil rights and civil liberties should not simply be subjugated and taken away from them. Whether you did those support you or not, yeah. Whether it was a class business, and certainly I'm sure there was classism that who is PJ to be prime minister, I'm sure that occurred. But he was putting policies out there that actually could be criticized. And so they were criticized, but that, that doesn't mean you could pass a law to say you can't criticize me. How would we feel today if laws were passed by Roosevelt's carrier that says you love you couldn't broadcast this thing tonight? Yeah. Or we couldn't go to United if I could speak, or nobody could gather in Roosevelt. That was the level of the laws that were being suggested for Dominica. That was intolerable. And so every reasonable citizen should have protested these laws, and many of them did. That's why so many people supported the protest. Why did they support it if everything was so loved and, and happy under him and just a few people were agitating for change? Okay, cool. We have someone on the line who wants to make a contribution. Caller, good evening to you. You want to add your voice to the conversation. Go right on. See, good evening. I want to add a voice to the, con to the contribution. I'm listening to Bernard Ito. And Bernard Ito is providing you handling information about anything. Most of the facts which you just spoke there are, are misleading. Now, let me just look at the whole 79 issue. Let us lay it from the foundation, Matt. Matt, I'm um, 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 lofty. May 29 was only a false foundation to get up to the forward, no matter what. No matter what. People talk about Leo Austin, Leo Austin, Leo Austin. Leo Austin is a post factor of 1979. 
So maybe because Eugenia has had Eugenia has had a personal grievance with Lee Austin. Can anybody mention anything Lee Austin between 1971 and 1978 that was so bad as Attorney General of Dominica? Can somebody enumerate? What are the things that Leo Austin was, who was Attorney General from 1971 to 1979, take out 1979 and mention the number of things that Leo Austin did between 1971 and 1978, which was so grievous to the laws of Dominica? Ask them to do that. There were several you know, for so many years, we have people who have been just mentioning names and brandishing certain things they would like the population of Dominica to believe because of their biases and because they want to justify the overthrow of Patrick John. Let us not forget Patrick John, the overthrow of Patrick John in 1979 wasn't anything to do with libel and slander act, anything to do with selling of Dominica, anything to do with any of that. The Freedom Party knew from 1976 that they wanted Patrick John out. And 1979 was only a culmination of everything these people wanted to do. With the 76th strike, with the 77th strike, with the 78th attempted strike, with the attempts to prevent Dominica from going to independence, and with all the machinations of all the organizations in Dominica, the Dominica Freedom Party and others, who just felt that Patrick George should not be Prime Minister of Dominica. I am saying that to say, indeed, in 1979 was so bad. Just. Why is it that worse is happening today by the very people who um, purport to remove Patrick John from power? Let us, let us look at what happened on Sunday last week. <laughs> right? Sunday last week. It was claimed that Patrick John wanted to give the North of Dominica to foreigners. Don Pearson. And when I eat up, it's not South Africa. It was Don Pearson who was going to be free port for the North of Dominica. No, and it wasn't the West Coast, it was the North. Part of that was supposed to have been the cabrits, the cabrits development, okay? And what did Charles Savre and all the freedom might say in 1979? That Patrick was going to destroy the mangrove in Portsmouth and that they should not give it to him. What happened last Sunday? The same Charles Savre was turning um, sword and breaking ground for a marina in Portsmouth in the very same place and the very same mangrove that they claimed Patrick was trying to destroy in 1979. Hey, you know, I cannot believe that in 2024, there are people who still want to continue to mislead the population of Dominica when it is clear in their eyes that what they did in 1979, the, the, the laws that Patrick Dunn passed in all of 1979 are still on the statute books today. Eugene entered in 1980 and did not repeal those acts. The laws are still on the statute books. Land in Dominica is being sold to Chinese, to foreigners, to Arabs, to Iranians, to all sorts of people today. And nobody, so Charles Savre, who was the architect of the overthrow for those things today, sat as a minister in this current Labour Party government and as president of Dominica and gave oversight to the very things that he spoke against being happening in Dominica. Right? The violation of people's rights, the breaking of the law by prime ministers and the people in government, the selling of Dominican land. If this was so wrong in 1979, why is they making it right today? You know? Let us not forget that leading up to 1979, the Freedom Party and who were saying Patrick John must go no matter what. And it's a fact that they didn't want Patrick John as prime minister of independence because they knew with the plans that Patrick John had prior to independence, and after independence, if Patrick John had ever stayed in power to implement it, the Freedom Party would be dead. That the bourgeois from Roseau and the aristocrats from Portsmouth would never have a chance to come and dominate the economic and political landscape of Dominica again, which okay. they are doing now. All right. Which they are doing now. And that's what they have to understand. They are facts. And you see, before I end, it is time people like Mr. Ito and all those who want to continue to create narrative and, and don't give the facts as they are, need to reflect on the attempts to continue to mislead the Dominican public. Because there were people, it's not only the freedom I who were alive in the 1970s, you know. there were other people who were alive in the 70s as well. Okay? And so what they want to think they want to continue to the time has come when people in Dominica will start to speak up. Because too many people in Dominica have been silent for too long, while these freedomites and these people who sort of continue to give their narrative.
People who are alive then must start speaking up, and I will speak up. All right, Paula. Thank make you. Sure you program and speak up because a lot was happening behind the scenes. All right, Paula. Thank you very much for your perspective, indeed. Much appreciated. Yes. All right, we have this brother here, Paul, and basically had some his perspective sort of right. different from you uh, sure. to somewhat he told. Any response from you? Sure. Uh, you know, and I, I, I know Simeon well, of course. And um, some of the things that he says, uh -huh. I would agree with. Um, there is no dispute in the fact that the Freedom Party wanted to get rid of Patrick John and wanted to um, form the government. But it's not what every uh, political party does to try to get rid of their political opponents and, and become the government. So there's nothing inherently wrong in the fact that the Freedom Party wanted to get rid of Patrick John. I mean, that is the nature of the beast. But in addition to just the normal politicking to replace a government, there were many fundamental issues wrong with the Patrick John administration in the late 70s that demanded urgent uh, action and response. And as much as Simeon might like the uh, uh, history to be revised, it just ain't so. Yeah. There, there were serious issues. And when you ask about um, Leo Austin and all the things that he did, there was the, 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 all the acts, the seditious and, and libel acts were architected by him. The dread acts were under his influence. Uh, the, the, what was it, Sunday Island? Sunday Island, Sunday Island fiasco was a definite um, 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 creation of his mind. So there were many things between 1971 and 1970. Everyone was looked at Leo Austin's record and his involvement in Dominican, almost everyone, has concluded that this man was a really bad influence on our government and our state of politics. Very few people disagree with that. So Neos is a, is a concluding matter. Now the issue of the bourgeois and the, the elites of Portsmouth and all that, I have already said, there was, there is, from the time of, of, of elections, um, universal elect, um, suffrage in 1958 in Dominica, that has always been an issue. It has always been an issue of, will the people from the smaller villages get to dominate the politics, or will the, 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 the people who had the power before, the Birchards and so on, the, the mulatto class, hang on to power. But that's just the dynamics of Dominica. It's not inherently evil or not. That is just the dynamics that we inherited as a society. And those dynamics had to be worked through. And certainly, um, Patrick John and his administration made it, made it was, was criticizable. It was a government that had many flaws, that had this government en enabled its programs, unlike what Simeon believed, I believe we would be, we would have been started in 1979, what Roosevelt Scary started in the year 2000, and, or 2000 whenever he took us prime minister, and we would have been 40 years into an autocratic, exploitative government rather than 23. And I cannot possibly yeah. see how that would have been a good thing for Dominica. Under Leo Austin and the influence that he had with Patrick John, and the legislation that they were trying to pass, and, and the, the, the suppression of opponents and, 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 and political opponents, it could not have turned out well. In fact, I'm telling me well of experience what happened in Grenada with a violent revolution had those, that process continued in Dominica. So it was a blessing that the, 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 the 1979 occurred as it did with a bloodless coup, but it would have certainly turned into a violent one had, had that not occurred. It was a blessing in disguise. But, but on the on the on another note, uh, brother Ito, would you say that uh, or would you agree that if it wasn't for the what do you call them the freedom fighters right. turned freedom party right. and this constant agitation after agitation after agitation, if these agitations were not there, they did not exist, would would would, would we have had a, a, a much more peaceful transition in the seventies? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think so because when you say the agitations, I wouldn't use it with agitation because I heard um, the object oh, just said from '71 he went back with that miss um, entering parliament issue. Yes. Then we had in '74, then '74. You know, but there were always protests against illegal action that the government was taking. And almost all the time they were against actions to shut down opposition or commentary on the government. You can't have a democracy where you, should, you do that. And so these agitations were nothing more than protest against the right for Dominicans to have inalienable civil liberties in the country. That was what the fight was for the 1970s. 
Will every Dominican, bourgeois or not, have a right to speak in his country about the issues and policies that affect him? That is the essential part of the 1970s. And so to, to call it agitation is not accurate in my book. These were, these were fights for the civil liberties of Dominicans that they could not be avoided. They simply could not be avoided. They had to happen. Um, and they should have been happening a lot more now and we'd be in a better position. The fact that this sort of fights for civil liberties is not occurring now, you can see the natural progression of where we have become. And so is that what we wanted by 1980 to have progressed to the point where we are now with our people uh, shackled and unable to speak and unable to protest and unable to, to, to shape their own destinies? Dominicans in 1979 still had heart, still had guts, still had independence to say no, our civil liberties matters and opportunities in this country matters and we're going to fight for it. And that was the fight for the 1970s. It wasn't primarily a class fight, it was a fight about civil liberties. Yes, it was led by those people who had a more active awareness of the implication of those laws, who were attorneys and maybe uh, more settled, more high up in society, yes. But it was a fight about the civil liberties and truly, to be honest, a fight that Patrick John was and his administration. And that type of government was not the type of regime that we needed to develop them. And it wasn't. And it still isn't. Because we still do the same thing today. We select people who are personable, who are liked by the public, who, um, who have, have, have come from the basic roots. And we say, well, they will do something for me. I can talk to them. They can pull a string for me. They can do this. I like it. We, we need the, the, the savior. We need, we need the Moses. right? Yeah. We need the big man. Yeah. And we do that today, and that is part of our problem. We need people who can govern on the right principles and do the right practice, not people that we can drink a beer with. Cool. All right. Here are Brother OJ's thoughts on exactly that point as to who he, you know, kind of put the blame squarely at their feet back then. Sure. The Freedom Valley was responsible, I mean, in your opinion as a minister then? In, in my opinion, Charles Sovereign and Eugenia Charles set it up. Because let me explain this to you. When I became involved with the process of emergence towards me becoming prime minister, let me understand this clearly. I had left um, Roseau, the area of the city. I was in the countryside. I wasn't aware of what was going on. I was from a sick bed. I was on my way out in the countryside. I received messages from persons whose name I wouldn't mention now unless I asked them permission to do so, who called me and said to me that there have been some committee for national salvation that was formed and that they have a desire and an interest to have me brought in to lead the country out of the situation of the breakdown of our democracy and of our constitution. For those who can't remember or wish not to remember, Fred de Gazon, the president, had absconded at night, had disappeared at night. And there was, to England, there was no president. No For president. those who wish to remember, the new president that Patrick John had approached was Sir Louis Cruz Latin. And there were persons, very eminent persons in our society, they know themselves, who went to the home of Sir Cruz Latin, removed his vehicle from his garage, burnt it in the center of Roseau, and that brought about the fact that he had to remove himself from being considered as a president. All right, so so that situation and more, Brother Ito Evans Major, mm -hmm. uh, Seraphine is attributing what happened back then to his laying it at the Freedom Party feet. Charles Sabra, Eugenia Charles being the main instigators. But of course, but of course, that's how it has been all the time. That's I can say yes, based on the meetings that I covered. Mm -hmm. I remember covering a meeting at um, Goodwill. Freedom Party had a meeting there on the Goodwill Savannah. And I have not mentioned the names of the speakers, but they indicated there will be blood ahoy. They insisted there will be blood ahoy. Okay. Right? I covered that meeting in plain clothes. And there were threats, serious threats to 
for people, people would die, no matter what happened. So they were very aggressive, and it was a Freedom Party meeting at the Goodwill Savon, at the Goodwill Savon. The thing is, somebody had to take the lead. Somebody had to take the lead. Yeah. And then somebody acting as advisor at the back. Now, if you look at it, there were three very powerful trade unions on the island back then. The Civil Service Association, headed by Charles Sabon, the Waterfront and Allied Workers Union, headed by Saboka, and the and, and the other one, Dao. Don't think I'm going to be looking at by Anthony as far as I know, as, as far as I know, they were all members of the Freedom Party. Mm -hmm. The CSA controlled government offices and what have you. Wau controlled the port. And Dao, I don't know. The banks, the banks. The banks and everything like that. So tell me, three heads in one bonnet, we're going to shut down the country. We shut down the port. Nothing comes, nothing goes. The civil issue, the recordings are still there. The hospital will not work, the police will not work, the fire service will not work. Now, you have sick people at the hospital. Massive demonstration on the 29th. You're trying to get food to feed the sick. Mm -hmm. And you're preventing that? It means you're wicked. People are sick, they are patients at the hospital. And ETV is trying to send food, sugar, rice, whatever it is, to feed the sick. And you don't want the vehicle to go there to drop the food there? So you want the people to die? But in the meantime, you have your supporters bringing in planting and dashing and potato and pig and everything. By truckload, that I saw. <coughs> By truckload. Wow. Yeah, I saw that. So we just, instead of going to the market on a Saturday, yeah, people so. Just go to Paris and leave with your bag of you know provisions and go home and then come do not go to work and report to Paris. And on that you have meetings and threatening people as I said at the beginning. You are threatening what they call the Bido or the poor too. Supporters of the Labour Party then. You understand? So that cannot be right. That it just cannot be right. You understand? And then when you follow the events. Because, I mean, we had to patrol the thing, you know, and everything, and then you listen to people in the call. It's, it's, it's a different story. Oh, they shouldn't do that. You understand? Right now, I am got this at home, I am got that at home. You can't go to Flossy, you can't go to Kazimi, you can't go to New Gen. The other places are closed. So you're not thinking of the, 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 the poorer people in society, where your home is full of food and, and fish and, and, and pig meat and coming from the country, because you want to say they don't follow the government. Marcel made reference to the unions. Mm -hmm. the, fire, the, the fire service and the prison service was part of the Police Welfare Association. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was then ch chairman of the Police Welfare Association. Charles Sabren's brother joined the fire service and was able to influence the fire officers to get out of the police welfare association and then influence the prison officers to get out of the police service, police welfare association. So they became members of, of the civil service association, the prison and the fire service under the influence of Charles Abre brother. Mm -hmm. They still rest in peace. So, so I don't think there's any, I will not deny, I don't think there's any denying yeah. that the Freedom Party was responsible for the organization and the agitation <coughs> that followed the May 90 something like that. Even towards the May 90 something like that. I mean, it is recorded clearly in history that yeah. Eugene Charles and Charles Saber were the responsible parties for these activities. There is no dispute in that. What I am what we're talking about though is the, whether these actions in the last scheme of things were ultimately justifiable against a rogue government that was shutting down the civil liberties of many Dominicans, and whether or not uh, those actions ultimately saved lives by not leading to a bloody revolutionary coup that occurred 
in Grenada and many other places. That is the key question. It's not whether or not the Freedom Party was responsible and involved in this action, they declared the war. The question is, were they truly freedom fighters? Or were they rogues acting in a manner that was detrimental to the nation? That is the question we have to ask. Now, I'm not saying some people didn't suffer. Certainly they did. There were not injustices done. Certainly they didn't. But when you're in the revolutionary spirit, that is the price of what occurs. And if we accept that it was a just revolutionary action, then they are going to be pain and suffering that occurs to the ordinary man in the street. The question is, was it justifiable and did it lead to a better Dominica? Or would the continuing and allowing the shutting down of our civil liberties and our economic opportunities in Dominica have, if we continue to allow it, would we have been a better country today? That's the key question. Yeah. So, so what right. do you see? Just, yeah, go ahead, go so ahead. would you see back then and what's the difference between then and now? Okay, we'll, 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 we will get to that, we'll get to that. I just want to finish up that segment here as to, you know, the details, the nitty-gritty, what went on on the day, before we go into, you know, where do we go from here. Pedro Caram is saying here, PJ was going to appoint Daddy, I guess that's uh, Mr. Jojo, as president, as Degas has, had fled at Parish Hall that night. I was there, I heard Sarve say on the mic, tonight we will teach Jojo Karam a lesson. And so that night the mob came and we got rains of stones for hours at home. That is Acme Garage. Every plate he said, every glass was broken. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. That did happen, yeah? Yeah, did that, happen. That's true. That is true. Wow. That is true. You understand? That is true. And um, how was he rewarded? He contested the elections how many times he lost. But he did. And then. When the Freedom Party came into office, wasn't he given a, a, a ministry at first? And Who? then well, Charles Abel. Who Charles Abel? He was a minister. Minister first. Yes. He was a minister with all portfolio. And then from yeah. there, Mr. Abel decided psychologically, you know, yeah. 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 the way you bulldoze Patrick, you might want to bulldoze me too. I should be your backside to do. Yeah, he wasn't trusted. No. The Freedom Party. He wasn't trusted. He shifted into Brussels. Yeah. You know, and then he came back, back and took over the leadership of the Freedom Party. Took over leadership of the Freedom Party, he didn't do well. And one night just and joined them in the front. And then on the front in 2004. Just right. dressing right at the very So that is why I always maintain, Lofty, I always maintain that what is passing as labor today is not labor. That's not the labor I took cool wash and do guard duty guarding this and fighting this in the bush. When they were in office in the seventies, you understand? Yeah. Because the very people, the very people who helped to stone, <clears throat> quote unquote, labor, is it that they know? All they do is carry the name, the symbol, and the color. But the real grassroots, poor man, labor man, they're not there anymore. They're not there anymore. In fact, most of the seniors have gone. You understand? So what is passing as the government is not the real Labour Party, the little man, you understand? The little man, the little man, the poor man, the dumb children. Today you look at the composition of the boards, statutory boards and corporations. You understand? No legal man is there. No genuine labor right is there. I know them. I'm old enough to know that. You understand? And maybe if people like Ed Scooby and Alvin Amman Trading and you know these people that they would be in positions as well. You understand? So it's not the same. The color is the same, the name is the same, the symbol is the same. But the principles, if you recall the principles of Freedom Party then, it wasn't easy, you know. Especially after the Defense Force was disbanded in 1981. Mm -hmm. In 1981, we had, a, I mean, like a, several examples that give you two. One, this is Ferdinand. Yeah. Trying to work in Totola as a radio station. The banning. They stop it. Free him back down. A group of us, 11, tried to work at DCP, as security. You understand? Mr. Nassif welcomed us. Some of us didn't stay two months. Why? Because the reports came. Oh, 
the event was one to take over your factory. As though, you know, back then they disbanded Defense Force, even though some of us were clean. I'm not saying some of my colleagues didn't try something, but some of us were clean. As we were looking as nobody. And with all that service that we gave to country, putting our lives at risk, as everyone can tell you, in the 70s in the hills, we got nothing. Yeah. We got nothing. The Freedom Party was there. Not a cent. And even when we tried to get a job somewhere, you were messed up. You were messed up. That's why I say the principles of what exists now is the same as what obtained in the 1980s. It's the same thing. If you don't think about it for 15 years, some benefited well, but some struggled just like we're doing today. So the principles of labor which I stood for and fought for, together like Evans and Valerie and even Jojo Karam himself, and that was Vanderpool, and and these guys, Clifford George, Blaze, and all these guys taking another job, taking free the, in the hills. It's not the same, Lofty. It is just not the same. I don't know if things will ever change. Lofty, I must say, I became a victim too under the Freedom Party. And I believe Miss Charles thought I was related to Patrick John. Okay. Right? Are you being a John or? Yeah, yeah. I've been a John. <laughs> right? I've been a John. Mm -hmm. And I do not know if you are aware there was a teacher they call Teacher Edwards, Foggy, mm -hmm. yeah. principal of Russell Boy School. He was, he was principal of the Russell Boy School where old grammar school is. Mm -hmm. I received, there was, the chief of police then told me there's a problem. Uh, he was a strong supporter of labor, mm -hmm. Upper River Street. I was sent to the parcel post by the chief of police that there's a problem at the parcel post. I went there, I saw teacher Edward standing at the entrance. I don't know whether he was the victim or whether the accuser or what. I happen to know him because he's from my village. But going to check on this report, I picked up another officer from the special branch. When I, in my private vehicle, when I reached by the bay front at the post office, I saw T.J. Edwards, I then realized this guy is T.J. Edwards' brother. I decided to tell him to remain in, the, in my vehicle. I proceeded to the person post. They told me that T.J. Edwards imported marijuana to Dominica. I said, not that T.J. Edwards I know. I said, not that T.J. Edwards I know. Okay. Tell me, yes. They gave me the parcel, I put it in my vehicle. I went to T.J. Edwards, I said to him, teach, what are you doing there? He told me books came in the name of the Principal Rosa Boy School. And uh, they wanted him to pay $5 stamp duty. He said he's not paying. They gave him $5 to pay. He said he's not paying him his books. So he told him, call the ministry. They called the ministry. They said they were calling the ministry, but they called the police. I brought teacher Edwards. Told him there seemed to be a problem with this parcel and they said, can you come to police headquarters? He came to the he came to, to CID, I record a statement procedure in getting books from donors and so on. I released him. At the time, the DPP's office, a woman DPP office was upstairs police headquarters. When I released him, they asked, she asked me why I didn't arrest him. I said, I have no evidence against the man. I said, but he has two sons studying in Jamaica. You should arrest him. They send in the drugs for him. I said, well, send me to Jamaica. Subsequently, the following day, there was a big demonstration outside, led by Charles Abra. The teachers at the time were Kelly the Ghost, Bottom Brain, um, Arthur Lee Richards, and um, Arthur Smith. They pulled out all the teachers from the school. Big demonstration, demonstrating we, don't, we are not teaching with any drug teacher. They transfer him to Girodel and they transfer me out of CID to La Plaine. Teacher Edwards left Dominica and never returned, neither his two sons who got scholarship as a doctor and as an engineer. And Doc, Teacher Edwards died 2019 in Miami on the 19th of December. His sons were Ridley, Ridley was one. Right? Ridley so, at Mr. say, Evanson is a very good policeman, but Never get to know. 
what that boat was. Because Patrick John and I carry the same surname. That's what I assume. Well, I mean, I will not, I think it would be silly of me to deny that there were not some acts of, 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 of let's call it retaliation, there were not some acts of, 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 of political victimization. victimization to some extent that occurred. Certainly the, the, the defense force were targeted, there's no doubt, mm -hmm. because the defense force were viewed as a, a very potential um, incendiary force within society who were trained and had arms and could potentially, um, uh, you know, engage in actions that would overthrow the government. And actually events proved that, it that decision to be correct. It and so the fact that the defense force was targeted, I'm, saying, I'm not saying it was justified, I'm not saying it was the right thing to do, but at least it's understandable that they would try to marginalize people who were in the defense force, right? Just try to keep them out of positions of power or influence so that they do not have that ability to, to, to attack the government. Um, I, I believe uh, my friend here, Evans, John, in, in, in some of the issues that occurred with the transfer and, and so on, there were certainly some individual issues that occurred, I have no doubt. And as a leader, you can't always control every subordinate and make sure that nobody does some of these things. And, and, and in fact, maybe Misha, not maybe, she probably was directed a few of those, um, those, 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 those things to be done. But I can be categorically clear. The Freedom Party was never developed a culture of political victimization as a modus operandi of the party or even a large aspect of the party and never had a culture where political victimization was part and parcel of its operation. Certainly nothing in comparison to today's political culture where political victimization is a large part of the operation of this government. The 1980 to 1995, every independent observer has said that that was the most honest, the least uh, politically victi victimized thing, clean government that existed in Dominica. And I believe that to be true, and independent observers have believed that to be true. So did some random act of victimization occur? I do not doubt that it did. I believe this gentleman in, in the this, this stories. But as a broad-based phenomenon, that was used as a strategic political weapon. The DFP did not um, use political victimization. And if a few things happened right after the revolutionary years, one can understand that these were cautionary actions. But the fifth, over the 50 years, no, the Freedom Party was not a party of political victimization. Okay, we In see. the most part, okay, we as see. I said, some certainly did occur. Okay, I'll tell you that now. In, in, in politics, you have some other fronts and some way at the back. And I have seen, I am from Minister Fred, and I have seen projects during back then, I'm only not remember, that was just yesterday, 82, 99, that was yesterday. I have seen, well I saw people applying for jobs, construction jobs and whatever, whatever. And Evans is a top notch with a man. But Evans is already working on two other projects. And Lofty, they're not sure about Lofty. They won't give Lofty the job, you know. They will wait until Evans finish. Wait until Evans finish to give it to him and leave Lofty without it. You know, these are things I saw in my eyes. So it's not everything the party does that you will know. Some will know, some will not know. Yeah. Like I said, you, you, can, you will not control every level. Yeah. But for me, That's in politics, as I told a good friend of mine, is good friend is a little red, yes. And he told me, excess in the boy, I cannot do that. I have served my country in various areas. If there is something for me, I'm a Dominican, I'm a taxpayer. If something is for me, give it to me. Don't tell me anything about color. Don't tell me anything about color, because when I was doing my duty, I wasn't seeing color. But when I was fighting along with Evans John and the others in the group to protect Dominica, I wasn't seeing color. I was fighting for the defense and the protection of the constitution of America and the flag. Sure. So tell me about color. And to me, as long as you are Dominican and there's a vacancy and you are qualified, give you the job. Whether you blue, you pink, you yellow, you brown, give you the job. Yep. Because you are Dominican. Sure. 
And that is my problem now, even now, because we know that. We know that. The fact is, you know, Lofty cannot do the job here. But Ito is far superior in qualifications and ability and everything. But because Ito is green and Lofty is red, you will forget him and his ability and his qualifications and criteria. When you get there, you're going back to the same Ito and say, but how do you do that now? Hmm. How do you do that? All right, gentlemen, we have been there for pretty close to two hours now. And we started at 20 past. Yeah, so we will wrap up in the next half an hour or so. But I'd really like us to focus our minds now on the, as I just <coughs> observed us said in song one time, where do we go from there? So it is true we recall certain events, the details, you know, who have to take blame, take blame. But, but at the end of the day, gentlemen, we have a country to build. And so it's in that vein now I want us to zero in on the last half hour to sort of, you know, paint that picture where do we want to see this Dominica move forward from this turbulent time, the 70s, the 80s, and, and, and not let us repeat it because it is not in any one of us interests if we repeat them. So, so let us just try to wrap on a much more positive note as our country is concerned. You know what I would like to see? A little more um, civic being taught at school. It worries me. It worries me when I pass by the state house mm -hmm. and I see the flag. The state of our state of Dominica flag and the president flag. It worries me when I pass by the ministry and I see the Dominica flag is hanging below the ministry on the ground. It should be on top of the building. It worries me when I do not see a master flag at Mount Bruce by the cross as I see in St. Lucia, Grenada and other country. It worries me when our flag is not being lowered after sunset, mm -hmm. it remains permanently on the, black pole, yeah. on the pole until it bleaches. And at the first place I saw it was at the High Court building, where it was put on a pole and remained there permanently until it rot. I believe it worries me too when I go to functions like in the stadium and the national anthem is being sung or played and I see police officers walking up and down not standing to attention. Mm -hmm. It worries me when I see the tone and tune of the national anthem is being played in any tune without no respect for national pride. We need to start teaching civics at our schools and to the young people. Thank you. Mr. John, you've seen that sign up there, right? Yep. Civic vibes. Yeah. So that is what I do here with a number of people every Sunday in particular. Okay. We, we go back to the basics and, and try to do some of what you're saying to inculcate in our younger folks yeah. those etiquettes. Yeah. So, so I may just be calling on you, you know, much more time <laughs> to help in that regard. No problem. But, but, but point well taken, and yes, yes, thanks, thanks for this one. But, but for me, Lottie, I, I, to me, it's time, it is high time that all Dominicans are treated equally, regardless of your political affiliation, your religious affiliation, whatever the case may be, your color, skin. Because we are all Dominicans, all. We still serve the same flag. We sing the same national anthem. We teach our children the national pledge. So why is it that some people are being given more than the others? And those that are getting the more, they have already. They have much more than the person who is asking for. So it means some are begging, 
and they are not getting, and some are not begging, and they are getting. Some are getting that they don't need. Case in point, look at Hurricane Maria. I saw, I went to pass from a particular village on the west coast. The person is my friend. I went in the yard. I saw a pile of materials, two by six, and whatever, covered as an element. I said, but what are you doing with that? He said, that's for me. I said, but nothing up the house. <laughs> you have a concrete roof. Nothing up the house. Why did I even hear that? Oh, what I cannot use as a cell. Mm -hmm. And there are people who really need that material to put a roof over their head. Why are you sidelining me? Because it is perceived that I'm green and red is in office. No, that has to stop. Because when disasters strike, it doesn't single out color. Yeah. I decide I take in out, I decalate in 10 roofs, I take in 10. I kill in 15 people, 15 dead. We all suffer when there is no water. As I told you when we were coming up here, I was living back and said, I come out here the way here for water. We have to struggle. But yet, when the relief comes, these are things I've seen. When the relief comes, some get and some don't get. Some get in the dead of night. And some don't get at all. That thing has to stop. We are all Dominicans and we worship the same God. Even if we are Anglican, Methodist, whatever the case may be, but it's God. So it means we are Dominicans. Our navel strings are buried somewhere under a coconut tree or a grapefruit tree or something. Yes, people are applying for jobs. Give the best person the job. Yeah. Give the best. It's just like you're going to build a house. You borrow. $500,000 from the bank. But you know Ito is a top class builder. But you know Evans as a carpenter. You understand? Ito is a builder, but John is a carpenter. But because of the connection between you and John, you will ignore Ito and give it to John. Only to find out John cannot do the job. And when he blunders, he goes back to it and say, Come and fix that for me. Yeah. Come and fix that for me. Didn't you know that John couldn't do the job? Give the job to it and say, John is my girlfriend, employ him. Sure. Employ him as a carpenter. <clears throat> it does turn to respond. Thank you, Brother Marshall, for, for those thoughts as to where we go or where we want to go from here. Um, but Ito, I just want to lay another scenario on the table before we close. Sure. Um, what occurred in 79? Can you guys envisage that happening again based on, based on our, our present situation? Things we have been dabbling into. Can answer where do we go from there, but that, that, that is a general question for us to answer. Sure, sure, yes. Um, I'll answer the question this way, Rob. Sure. Um, where do we go from here is very dependent on where we came from. Mm -hmm. And where we came from is a post-colonial, post-slavery society. That has created some extreme dysfunctions that carry on well into the 21st century in our society. Okay? Because, for one, the, when the enslaved people were released, they still look to the big man, the estate owner, as the big man, the God on earth, to solve their problems, to provide for them, to direct their affairs, to defer to them. That has continued because Dominica remained very enclaved societies for many, many years, well into the 1950s and 60s. And so that certain, that certain, and then of course there were the people inherited the estates, who were the mulatto children of the white folks and local people, 
um, to form that class of people who, 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 who grab the reins of economic power and establish their own economic class after slavery was over. So that created a dynamic situation that has persisted into that a class system. Okay? But you see, because of that setup, our country has always embraced a politics that is very personalistic and very patronage based. It is always, I vote for you, you do something for me, you provide for me, you give me something, I am your buddy. I like you, we like the man that can, everybody likes, let's get this guy because you know he can bring the bacon for us. It has never gotten to the point so far where we are a policy-based society, where we look at the issue and we say, who are the best people to solve the problems and to develop policies that, as my good friend asked for, benefits all the people without color, without consideration of, 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 of class and all of those things. And so Dominica's problem is a problem of lack of political development. In the sense that every society has to go through the stages where you start with tribalism and then you get to a certain um, personalistic politics where people do for you directly. But then you transcend that and you get into a policy uh, a politics where it is based on finding problems for social problems that benefit everybody. And we never got them. Now what happened in 1979? was actually, in my opinion, a beginning of a breakthrough of that sort of personalistic, patronage-based politics that came through in a violent manner, but it really re-established in Dominica a very transparent, for the most part, um, government that was trying to be build a politics based on principle, based on policy, based on doing the right things for the country. Um, and again, independent observers have seen that. We had 50 years of that progress. Had we gotten, a, in my mind, another 10 years of that sort of political culture on the island, we probably would have, have, have succeeded in transforming the mindset of Dominicans to a policy-based um, politics. But we didn't get, we devolved back by the election recently of this current government into that sort of personalistic, non-policy, patronage, handout politics that we inherited from the 60s and 70s. We went back to it, we lost the momentum. We didn't get to the top of the hill where we'd have a turning point and transform the way we operate in Dominica to give the sort of fair political uh, governance that we're asking for. So that is our problem in Dominica. Our problem is to break away from that personalistic, I like that guy, he can sit there, I like him, he's friendly with me, to look at who are the people who can do the job, could solve the very deep technical problems that it requires for the country, and to elect people like that, who will do it for love of country, for personal pride, for personal uh, professional accomplishment, not for personal enrichment, not for, <coughs> for, for some power trip. Yeah. And sure. that is the problem of Dominica. We have to transform the sort of politics that we're in the job. Sure. Thanks. Levers Esprit is asking, Mr. John, is the police commissioner of international security responsible or has the right to make sure of what you just spoke about in terms of the lowering of the flag and whatever on government building, that they have a responsibility to protect the flag? You see, just asking that question. The CAPSEC. It falls under the portfolio of the CAPSEC. Cabinet secretary. Cabinet secretary. But, um... It, 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 yeah, it falls under the portfolio. I remember Mr. Shaw, mm -hmm. Mr. Signoret, mm -hmm. wherever they see any flaws in, they would call the chief of police. Mm -hmm. And the protocol follows, yes? Uh, but, but, uh, that's how the protocol follows. But, but as a young man, I remember the flag being lowered. Yeah. The police station but, but yeah. That should be, that should be common It's knowledge. a standard. It's a standard it's a practice. Standard practice. It's a standard practice and procedure. And procedure. You, for instance, but, but because we have lost our national pride, and that's gone down the drain, you know. Yep. And I started, I remember, I remember once passing by the ministry, Felix Gregor was capsec. I call him, I tell him, look at the flag outside the office. He changed it the next day. He cha Felix Gregor changed it. He was capsec. 
But at least it's a matter of national pride, pride. awareness. Yeah, but, 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 but Mr. Ito, that is standard operating procedures. Yeah. If you were in the military, you were, you were, you know, the police, wherever, the paramilitary things, first thing in the morning, six o'clock, the flag goes up. Sunrise and sunset. Sunrise and sunset, yeah. you bring it down. Yeah. Yes. I saw them looking at the police at Yes, yes. yes. Like yeah, I think the police is still doing it. Flag has to be uh, in front of the charge police. office. Charge office yeah. yeah, it has to be. And it's not supposed to touch the ground. Yeah. No, it's not supposed to. So it's supposed to be folded. And put in a shoulder and fold it, not supposed to touch the ground and at the all. Next one in bring it. Yeah. yeah, there's a way to tie it. If yeah. you have a bugle, you yeah. sound the, the bugle and then you bring the flag. You bring the flag. Yeah. So that would be common knowledge at all police stations and priests and everywhere. And even at if all police stations, there should be a flag. Yes. All police stations should be government voice, headquarters. Uh, government headquarters, all government you, buildings. You have policemen there on duty all the time. So when it is 6 o'clock, the policeman should know to bring on the flag. And not only bring it down and put it on the shoulder, you know. You fold, fold, it fold it in a special way. In a special way. And put on the side, not on the floor. Put somewhere on up. On a shelf. And next morning, take it 5 to 6, tie it, and then break it. When you pull it up, break it. Boom. There's a standard procedure. Standard procedure. That's something I learned tonight for sure. Uh -huh. Among other things. Um, but folks, just before we wind up here, let me just make a special announcement here. Uh -huh. Because my brother Alex Powell Bruno, he'll be continuing sort of that kind of conversation okay. after I'm done here tonight. And he will be basically talking about the Dominica political upheaval of the May 29th. That's what we're discussing tonight. Uh -huh. um, it happened almost two generations ago. And he's asking the all-important question or questions tonight. Have we moved on? And if not, how do we progress from this political chapter? So, folks, those of you who are here with me, as soon as I'm done, you can tune in to Brother Alex Power through this page, and that conversation will continue. All right? So I just thought I would stick that in there as a continuum of the conversation we're having here. Um, right, I want to follow up question to the panel, I think, among yeah, why would happen you, today, right? Now, yes, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. A while ago, you, you asked, mm. will that May 29th? Very well. That, that's the final yes. in my opinion, pack I want us to end with. In my opinion, I say yes. Why? But honestly, I wish it never happens. Because if it happens, it's not going to be like 79. A lot it, of lives will be lost. It, it will be worse. Much worse. <clears throat> because in 79, Evans can tell you, we face a lot of small arms fire. <laughs> you know, shotguns and yeah. scatter shot and that. Outside there, from yeah, what I've seen, I have seen heavy weapons. And don't tell me, you can be the bravest policeman, but you know that is waiting for you outside there, you'll think twice. Just think of the disappearance of the weapons from a police station. Exactly. 3,000 rounds of ammunition. Exactly. Wow. That is Nine awesome. weapons. High powered weapons have not been recovered. Oh, yes. In whose hands are they? In whose hands that is? We do not know. Not no. the police for sure. Things like that, I would urge those who are hearing. Any information pass it to the police because there are a lot of weapons you, out you there. You have to listen to the people and do not provoke them to anger. Because the human brain can only take so much. So, any telltale signs as to. Some things that... That's not for me to release anyway, I will not say that. But, <laughs> you, back then, when I was in the country, living in the country, we used to carry water in Calabash. Calabash, for, for fresh water. Yeah. And when you carry water in that Calabash, you carry water. Sometimes you, you, you put two fingers in there, put in your head. Mm -hmm. After when that falls down, brah, and it break because it can no longer take the rest. So when you provoke people to anger, not everybody thinks, you know, the same thing. Not only the same way. What you can bear, I cannot bear. You understand? And then you have to think of people. Just look at society today. Two things as I close. Stress, frustration. Pressure can lead you to do anything. You cannot get somebody to attack. You are in anger. You are vex. You are frustrated. What you do? You kill yourself. You commit suicide. Either by hanging yourself, shooting yourself, falling over a precipice. All those things, I'm no psychologist, but those things can happen. And you mustn't prove, you know, as though you mustn't take people too far. 
people must see. And a lot of people, I remember in a class, one at a military lecture, the, the, the officer told me, when I asked the question, he said, Mr. Dino, I can see right through your stomach. I can see through you. Because people are seeing love. And people are hearing. And it's not filtering down. You understand? So yes. when people get frustrated, anything can happen. Sure. But for me, I wouldn't wish for another thing like that. But all I know, if it happens, Evans, it will not be us. It will not be nice. It will not be nice. No. I'm not calling for that for Dominica, but whatever will be, will be. You know? Okay. Yes, you um, do. Well, I, <clears throat> I'm skeptical it could happen. Mm. I mean, as my brother said, if anything is possible, and there is some point at which oppression, depression, frustration, loss of hope becomes so extreme that people take extreme measures. Exactly. So I would not say it is not possible. But the insidious thing, the devious thing that has happened here recently in Dominica is that that spirit of standing up for your rights, that spirit of being independent, that spirit of being uh, 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 taking a stance against the government when they become oppressive has been economically and psychologically conditioned out of a large portion of our population. The people in the 1979 were independent economically for the most part. They were farmers, they had their own land, they grew their own food, they were working, they were professionals, they were up police officers, they were independent of necessarily a handout from the government. In fact, that did not happen very often. Right? So they had a certain sense of economic self-sustainability. Now most of the population feels if they say anything, the economic future is threatened either directly or indirectly through employers or other people or opportunities they're denied. Right? So people are economically constrained. Then psychologically, they have been made to feel intimidated, threatened, people will inform on them. Once somebody here, you blue or you green, that is almost a death sentence in Dominica because now you're on the bad boys list. And so all social opportunities are denied you, advancements in your career, all sorts of things, negative things come in. So psychologically, people are afraid to speak out because you can only speak out one at a time. And they're afraid that this is going to lead to dire consequences for them in this society. So after 25 years of that psychological terrorism and economic terrorism, People are at a point where they are really almost resigned to their fate in terms of accepting some of the most outrageous things that are happening in the country. So can we rally 15, 20,000 people onto the streets of Roseau like they were able to do in 1979? It's a much more difficult task given the psychological profile of our population. Um, but as was said, at some point, if extreme events continue to happen and people are put to the point of hopelessness, there are things that can make the society cry. But, but we, we face, I think, as political activists, as community activists, a much more difficult task than the organizers in 1979 to rally people to a national cause that is just and to rally them to place, not violence, but to place pressure on the government. We face a much more difficult task to to, to, to mobilize people given the terrorism, economical and psychological they have suffered in the past 25 years. Thank you. Gentlemen, nice discussion tonight, very informative, I must say. Uh, any, any final thoughts from you guys before we leave? Final thoughts. Um, I just want to thank you for inviting me again here. May 29th is, is the day, is the date, I think it was a Wednesday it was? Tuesday. Tuesday, okay. That day will stay in my mind for a very long time. Just this morning I felt very happy when my <coughs> wife and my daughter were issuing pictures of me in the defense force. Okay. My daughter telling her son, tell the missus your grandfather. 
and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and so. I, I served well, I, I enjoyed it. And, but things have changed. Our leaders, whoever, you know, the holy rings of governance is governing the country, must listen to the people. They must listen. Because Mr. Edo is a politician. He knows that not every people, not everybody will vote for you. Not everybody will support you. So even if the person doesn't support you, or it is perceived that he didn't vote for you, but the person is a Dominican, he's a native, and he or she, not should you know, but must be treated equally, giving his, him or her a fair share of the national game. Not everybody can get the same amount, but if his two homes is that is for him, Give it to him. And he'll feel a lot more comfortable because he can go back home and share his two homes among his two of children. And life will be different. We must stop making people dependent on politicians. We have moved to that stage now. Because if you go around the country, lofty, you do that. You watch so many abandoned banana fields. You know, people no longer grow dashing. They, 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 they. Some people, because they do not eat it, they do not grow it. You understand? And so we have become a, a, a kind of country. The beauty of Dominica is still there, but there is still too much hardship in the place. Some of them are getting too much, and some of them are not getting enough. Thank you, Lord. Lofty, I do not Thank believe you. this is a spiritual guidance. I don't know. This gathering is a spiritual guidance. By coincidence, or by spiritual guidance, I sit next to Nigel, um, Nigel every Sunday in church, next to him. The first flight after COVID, I slept at the Puerto Rico airport together with Mr. Ito. I did not know him. He knew me, I did not know him. We slept at the airport, the first flight. We never spoke to each other. He read a book for the whole night. I slept. In the morning at 4 a.m., I say, are you going to Dominica? He tell me yes. He say, yes, Mr. John. I say, how do you know me? He said, Boys Avenue. And we exchanged from since then. We got very close. I believe God will put a hand to guide Dominica. I have that belief. I see the trend at night in my dream that very likely to happen again in Dominica. I hope not. May 29, 19. May 29, 1979. I see in my dream. I'm praying that it do not happen. Right? The churches need to pray. The religious groups need to pray. But God is in control. And I hope not. Let them make the leaders take the right decision to protect Dominica. But we are sitting on a time bomb. Very much afraid. Mr. Evans, thank you very much, my brother, for your very inspiring thoughts and motivating words as well. Thank you. Yes, Lofty, I know it's late, so I'll be brief. Yeah. And uh, this gentleman here, I have always told him he's a walking history book, and we have to treasure him and get that knowledge recorded. He knows everything about everything that happened in the seven. That is, that is part of the, the exercise tonight. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I'll just say briefly, uh, I mean, 1979 was about independent Dominicans fighting to maintain and establish that they have the right to protest the government and they have the right to their civil liberties that should not be snuffed out. We should not forget that lesson. The other important lesson that for me occurred in 1979 is we were able to break away from a very personalistic politics into a more rational, policy-driven politics of the 1980s. For 15 years, and it's not because it's a DFP thing, I, I would have said that against, uh, for any government who governed in that manner. There was a movement to away from personalistic politics to a policy politics. Unfortunately, we have lost that, and we've gone back to very personalistic handled politics. Instead of moving forward, our political development, which is a process which has to occur in every country, has gone backward. We now have a major task in our hands as Dominicans to move our political development forward. 
but that requires we elect and select different kinds of leaders. That we understand that if we want a policy-driven government, we need to elect policy-driven men and women who are in this thing not for personal reasons, but for the ability to do the job. And that is the transformation that we need, and that is the transformation to me, May 1979 uh, symbolizes. An independent people, a free people, trying to do the right thing against all of us. So thank you very much for having me on, and uh, it was a pleasure. All right, Radito, thank you very much as well for your very candid composition here tonight. Uh, what would the program be without you three gentlemen here in terms of your wisdom, your recollections? You basically made it a very, very interesting and informative program. So I, I want to thank you guys for, you know, just, just being here and adding much value to the much needed composition that we have to continue to have in Dominica. As I started, I'm going to end with that song of Brother Nassio Fonte. He calls it um, Black Tuesday. That is basically the day, as Brother Evan said, Tuesday, that um, we, we, we don't want to see a repeat in our country. But, like it says, history has a way of repeating itself, but it is we to ensure that history does not repeat itself that kind of by, by the way of our good action.